I want to open with a question. Is it ever okay to say to someone, unless you harm your body, I'm going to financially cut you off, abandon you, or spread a secret about you? I hope most of you are thinking, it's not. But let's hold on to that thought for a second. Because if a pregnancy or an abortion carries with it the risk of bodily harm, why is it that women are being threatened in this way every day? This is reproductive coercion. Hardly anyone knows what it is, and yet it really is no myth that parents and partners use violence and emotional manipulation to force someone into a pregnancy or an abortion. There are many forms of reproductive coercion, such as birth control tampering and stealthing, which involves a non-consensual removal of a condom. And yes, it can happen to men as well as women, where different cultures, backgrounds, and religions can affect each person's experience. But today, I want to focus on pregnancy and abortion pressure, specifically on women in countries where abortion has already been legalized. Now, I know what you're all thinking, so I'm going to address the elephant in the room. This is not exactly a fun topic. But it's exactly the reason why reproductive coercion is still so widespread. No one wants to talk about it. So, bear with me. Allow yourselves to be mindful this evening. And hopefully, we can find some solutions to the problem together. But why this topic? Well, UK government statistics show that in 2017, nearly 200,000 abortions took place. And Claire Bremner, a leading counsellor in the Abortion Recovery Care and Helpline Service, said that 75% of those women were either pressurised or bullied into having one. This is a significant risk factor for emotional or psychological problems thereafter. We clearly have an issue here. Women have fought for so long for body, bodily autonomy. But this, if this is happening so frequently, what does my body my choice really mean. As an advocate for gender equality and having worked in gynaecology, I've spoken to many women with different experiences. I know of cases ranging from women being dragged to abortion clinics against their own will, to those being kicked in the stomach, inducing a miscarriage. I've spoken to women who nearly died owing to a coerced pregnancy, and those who are trying to raise children on their own, but are struggling because the father does not wish to be involved and is now refusing to pay child support. So I felt a responsibility to bring this to light. And it seemed evident to me that the involvement of both men and women was essential, which is why I set up the He For She Society at my university. We are in a collaboration with Good Lad Initiative and we associate with the UN Women. So, you're probably thinking, but surely the law is doing something about this, right? Well, not as much as we would have hoped. Even with the introduction of coercion into the Scotland Domestic Abuse Act recently, where reckless behaviour intended to cause someone psychological or physical harm is technically considered an offence, women are still not being sufficiently protected, as most controlling cases are dropped. Why? Well, it's not always inherently obvious that someone's being coerced. And a lot of these cases aren't taken into consideration unless it escalates to harassment. But in reality, it can take even minimal pressure in a highly emotional situation to put someone in the position where it is difficult for them to make an objective decision. So we cannot allow this to be happening several times before it is recognized. It is too late then. However, without a legal precedent, it can be difficult for the law to know how to approach these cases. And this is why we need more awareness, so that we can start to be more conscious of whether this is happening to us. And hopefully, as a consequence, we'll see more cases start to unfold. This was a situation in 1973 with a Roe v. Wade case in the United States, which was the landmark decision and basis for all future decisions on the law surrounding criminalization and restricted access surrounding abortion. Just to show you how often this is trivialized and considered a myth, a US legislative council in the United States described a proposal to protect women 
against forced abortions as creating a problem when none exists. This is why victims of coercion are being completely ignored. And I want to tell you about one of these victims called Sophia, whose name I've changed for privacy reasons. Sophia was pressured into an abortion by her partner and family members who took advantage of her emotionally vulnerable position at the time. The doctors in the hospital never asked Sophia whether she was being coerced before her procedure. And not only did she have to take time off work to physically recover, but she also had to go see a psychologist to deal with the loss and grief of losing her child. She was completely alone in the whole process and was never given any acknowledgement for her grief, nor was she able to secure justice. Now, Sophia is just an example of the many women in this situation. And this seems awfully similar to a lot of sexual harassment cases in the past, where women were completely overlooked by society and the law. But luckily, now in the Me Too and Time's Up era, we are seeing so many brave women speak up about their experiences surrounding sexual harassment. And now, I am reaching out to the victims of coercion to stand up to. We want these stories to be told. So, what else aside from the law can be done to help change the situation? Well, education is essential. I remember in my own school sex education classes, topics beyond contraception such as healthy relationships were rarely discussed. We never had conversations on respect or consideration towards someone else's body. Nor were we encouraged to have these discussions before sex. If we want to be encouraging equality in schools, we need to be putting emphasis on the involvement of both boys and girls, and that no one should have to violate their bodies under pressure from someone else. This is why it would also help us to have conversations around intimate partner violence, as a lot of children who have grown up in domestic abuse households are more likely to try and imitate this behavior in their own relationships. It would be beneficial to actually understand the main factors contributing to this form of intimidation. And in fact, we've seen that there's a link between lack of responsibility and coercion rates, in the sense that it's more likely for someone to try and pressure someone out of a pregnancy if their ultimate aim is to avoid any obligations thereafter. So surely this is an aspect education should be focusing on as well. When we grow up, we are told by our parents and, and schools that we are accountable for our own actions. If we don't revise for a test, we will fail it. If we're mean to someone, we should apologize. So how about the notion of responsibility when it comes to sex and pregnancy? Surely the same rules should apply. If this were the case, we would be seeing men and women taking on that responsibility together. However, Statistics from housing charity shelter show differently. They show that 92% of single parent families are headed by mothers. And that the majority of those accepted as homeless are single female parents with dependent children. These women are restricted by childcare duties and are forced to, low, to, to work low paid jobs. But why is there this big imbalance? Well, like in the case of Sophia, by putting our emphasis on women taking that responsibility. We are only encouraging an unhealthy mindset amongst young boys and girls who are led to believe that birth control is primarily a woman's duty and that she is expected to carry both the load and fault of an unwanted pregnancy. So we start to see situations where men are pressuring women not to use condoms, but who simultaneously don't want the consequences of unprotected sex. In the words of Gabrielle Blair, saying that women should simply insist on using a condom ignores a huge power dynamic that exists between men and women in the real world. Similar to saying that someone who is being harassed by their supervisor should just speak up. We know it's not that simple. In a society where women are fighting to gain and maintain equal standing with men, it is fundamental that men join us in taking this responsibility. So hopefully, we'll see, as a consequence, coercion rates decrease, and we can rebalance this, the current situation.
Finally, I just want to touch upon healthcare because obstetricians, gynecologists, and nurses are in the unique position to address coercion. <clears throat> so uh, they can ask patients questions such as, does your partner support your decision about if and when to become pregnant? Or is it your decision to abort? Whilst hospitals should have these policies in place, they're not always routinely implemented. We can use um, statistics and research to raise public awareness on how often this is happening by tracking incidents in hospitals such as how many women are coming in who are being coerced. What age range are they? Are they from primarily ethnic minority backgrounds or on a low income? This would also help us know where to focus our attention. Practitioners should be aware of the links between intimate partner violence and pregnancy pressure, as some of these women may have abusive partners who are trying to interfere with their contraception. Healthcare staff can provide interventions if they realize that something is wrong, such as offering harm reduction strategies or giving discreet and confidential contraception, such as IUDs. This has been proven to significantly lower the rate of coercion. If anyone in this audience or anyone watching at home feels like they might be being coerced, know that there are hotline numbers you can call. And you can always warn a hospital in advance. So, I've spoken a lot today about what institutions can do. But what can you do? Well, first of all, we can all start to be more conscious about what's happening around us. If we see someone not acting in the right way, speak up. Explain to them why it's not right. They might not even realize they're doing it. If you think a family, fam family member, friend, or colleague is being coerced, talk to them. See if they understand what's going on. And make sure that they realize that being given an ultimatum such as, I'll stay with you if you do this for me, is not the same as being given a true choice. Ultimatums, by definition, do not offer a true choice, and the outcomes are often unpleasant. You can also help people by giving them support, assisting them to seek outside help, and informing on the coercer. Now, it may not seem like you're doing much, but if one person at a time starts to recognize this, then it becomes a lot of people. And a lot of people bring about change, change which hopefully governments will listen to. After all, the first step to solving any problem is to acknowledge it. Now, I want to conclude with a quotation from the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. Capacity for evil resides in all our societies, but so too do the qualities of understanding, kindness, justice, and reconciliation. Thank you.